Gaudium et spes, joys and hopes. Pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. Paul, bishop, servant of the servants of God, together with the fathers of the sacred council for everlasting memory. The joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the men of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these too are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in their hearts. For theirs is a community composed of men. United in Christ, they are led by the Holy Spirit in their journey to the kingdom of their Father, and they have welcomed the news of salvation, which is meant for every man. That is why this community realizes that it is truly and intimately linked with mankind and its history. Hence, this Second Vatican Council, having probed more profoundly into the mystery of the Church, now addresses itself without hesitation, not only to the sons of the Church and to all who invoke the name of Christ, but to the whole of humanity. For the Council yearns to explain to everyone how it conceives of the presence and activity of the Church in the world of today. Therefore, the Council focuses its attention on the world of men, the whole human family, along with the sum of those realities in the midst of which that family lives. It gazes upon that world which is the theater of man's history and carries the marks of his energies, his tragedies, and his triumphs, that world which the Christian sees as created and sustained by its maker's love, fallen indeed into the bondage of sin, yet emancipated now by Christ. He was crucified and rose again to break the stranglehold of personified evil, so that this world might be fashioned anew according to God's design and reach its fulfillment. Though mankind today is struck with wonder at its own discoveries and its power, it often raises anxious questions about the current trend of the world, about the place and role of man in the universe, about the meaning of his individual and collective strivings, and about the ultimate destiny of reality and of humanity. Hence, Giving witness and voice to the faith of the whole people of God gathered together by Christ, this council can provide no more eloquent proof of its solidarity with the entire human family with which it is bound up, as well as its respect and love for that family, than by engaging with it in conversation about these various problems. The council brings to mankind light kindled from the gospel and puts at its disposal those saving resources which the church herself under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, receives from her founder. For the human person deserves to be preserved. Human society deserves to be renewed. Hence, the pivotal point of our total presentation will be man himself, whole and entire, body and soul, heart and conscience, mind and will. Therefore, this sacred synod proclaims the highest destiny of man and champions the godlike seed which has been sown in him. It offers to mankind the honest assistance of the church in fostering that brotherhood of all men which corresponds to this destiny of theirs. Inspired by no earthly ambition, the church seeks but a solitary goal, to carry forward the work of Christ himself under the lead of the befriending spirit. And Christ entered this world to give witness to the truth, to rescue and not to sit in judgment, to serve and not to be served. To carry out such a task, the church has always had the duty of scrutinizing the signs of the times and of interpreting them in the light of the gospel. Thus, in language intelligible to each generation, she can respond to the perennial questions which men ask about this present life and the life to come and about the relationship of the one to the other. We must therefore recognize and understand the world in which we live, its expectations, its longings, and its often dramatic characteristics, some of the main features of the modern world can be sketched as follows. Today, the human race is passing through a new stage of its history. Profound and rapid changes are spreading by degrees around the whole world. Triggered by the intelligence and creative energies of man, these changes recoil upon him, upon his desires and decisions, both individual and collective, and upon his manner of thinking and acting with respect to things and to people. 
Hence, we can already speak of a true social and cultural transformation, one which has repercussions on man's religious life as well. As happens in any crisis of growth, this transformation has brought serious difficulties in its wake. Thus, while man extends his power in every direction, he does not always succeed in subjecting it to his own welfare. Striving to penetrate farther into the deeper recesses of his own mind, he frequently appears more unsure of himself. Gradually and more precisely, he lays bare the laws of society, only to be paralyzed by uncertainty about the direction to give it. Never has the human race enjoyed such an abundance of wealth, resources, and economic power. Yet a huge proportion of the world's citizens is still tormented by hunger and poverty, while countless numbers suffer from total illiteracy. Never before today has man been so keenly aware of freedom, yet at the same time, new forms of social and psychological slavery make their appearance. Although the world of today has a very vivid sense of its unity and of how one man depends on another in needful solidarity, it is most grievously torn into opposing camps by conflicting forces. For political, social, economic, racial, and ideological disputes still continue, continue bitterly, and with them the peril of a war which would reduce everything to ashes. True, there is a growing exchange of ideas, but the very words by which key concepts are expressed take on quite different meanings in diverse ideological systems. Finally, man painstakingly searches for a better world without working with equal zeal for the betterment of his own spirit. Caught up in such numerous complications, very many of our contemporaries are kept from accurately identifying permanent values and adjusting them properly to fresh discoveries. As a result, buffeted between hope and anxiety and pressing one another with questions about the present course of events, they are burdened down with uneasiness. This same course of events leads men to look for answers. Indeed, it forces them to do so. Today's spiritual agitation and the changing conditions of life are part of a broader and deeper revolution. As a result of the latter, intellectual formation is ever increasingly based on the mathematical and natural sciences and on those dealing with man himself, while in the practical order, the technology which stems from these sciences takes on mounting importance. This scientific spirit exerts a new kind of impact on the cultural sphere and on modes of thought. Technology is now transforming the face of the earth and is already trying to master outer space. To a certain extent, the human intellect is also broadening its dominion over time, over the past by means of historical knowledge, over the future by the art of projecting and by planning. Advances in biology and psychology and the social sciences not only bring men hope of improved self-knowledge. In conjunction with technical methods, they are also helping men to exert direct influence on the life of social groups. At the same time, the human race is giving ever-increasing thought to forecasting and regulating its own population growth. History itself speeds along so rapid a course that an individual person can scarcely keep abreast of it. The destiny of the human community has become all of a piece. Where once the various groups of men had a kind of private history of their own. Thus, the human race has passed from a rather static concept of reality to a more dynamic, evolutionary one. In consequence, there has arisen a new series of problems, a series as important as can be, calling for new efforts of analysis and synthesis. By this very circumstance, the traditional local communities such as father-centered families, clans, tribes, villages, Various groups and associations stemming from social contacts experience more thorough changes every day. The industrial type of society is gradually being spread, leading some nations to economic affluence and radically transforming ideas and social conditions established for centuries. Likewise, the practice and pursuit of city living has grown, either because of a multiplication of cities and their inhabitants or by a transplantation of city life to rural settings. New and more efficient media of social communication are contributing to the knowledge of events. By setting off chain reactions, they are giving the swiftest and widest possible circulation to styles of thought and feeling. 
It is also noteworthy how many men are being induced to migrate on various counts and are thereby changing their manner of life. Thus, a man's tie with his fellows are constantly being multiplied. At the same time, socialization brings further ties without, however, always promoting appropriate personal development and truly personal relationships. This kind of evolution can be seen more clearly in those nations which already enjoy the convenience of economic and technological progress, though it is also a stir among peoples still striving for such progress and eager to secure for themselves the advantages of an industrialized and urbanized society. These people, especially those among them who are attached to older traditions, are simultaneously undergoing a movement toward more mature and personal exercise of liberty. A change in attitudes and in human structures frequently calls accepted values into question. This is especially true of young people who have grown impatient on more than one occasion and indeed become rebels in their distress. Aware of their own influence in the life of society, they want to assume a role in it sooner. As a result, parents and educators frequently experience greater difficulties day by day in discharging their tasks. The institutions, laws, and modes of thinking and feeling as handed down from previous generations do not always seem to be well adapted to the contemporary state of affairs. Hence arises an upheaval in the manner and even the norms of behavior. Finally, these new conditions have their impact on religion. On the one hand, a more critical availability to distinguish religion from a magical view of the world and from the superstitions which still circulate purifies religion and exacts day by day a more personal and explicit adherence to faith. As a result, many persons are achieving a more vivid sense of God. On the other hand, growing number, numbers of people are abandoning religion in practice. Unlike former days, the denial of God or of religion or the abandonment of them are no longer unusual and in individual occurrences. For today, it is not rare for such decisions to be presented as requirements of scientific progress or for a certain new humanism. In numerous places, these views are voiced not only in the teachings of philosophers, but on every side they influence literature, the arts, the interpretation of the humanities and of history, and civil laws themselves. As a consequence, many people are shaken. Because they are coming so rapidly, and often in a disorderly fashion, all these changes beget contradictions and imbalances, or intensify them. Indeed, the very fact that men are more conscious than ever of the inequalities in the world has the same effect. Within the individual person, there too often develops an imbalance between an intellect which is modern in practical matters and a theoretical system of thought which can neither master the sum total of its ideas nor arrange them adequately into a synthesis. Likewise, an imbalance arises between a concern for practicality and efficiency and the demands of moral conscience. Also, very often, between the conditions of collective existence and the requisites of personal thought and even of contemplation. Specialization in any human activity can at length deprive a man of a comprehensive view of reality. As for the family, discord results from demographic, economic, and social pressures or from difficulties which arise between succeeding generations, or from new social relationships between men and women. Significant differences crop up too between races and between various kinds of social orders, between wealthy nations and those which are less influential or are needy. Finally, between inter international institutions born of the popular desire for peace and the ambition to propagate one's own ideology, as well as collective greed existing in nations or other groups. What results is mutual distrust, enmities, conflicts, and hardships of such as man at once the cause and the victim. Meanwhile, the conviction grows not only that humanity can and should increasingly consolidate its control over creation, but even more that it devolves on humanity to establish a political, social, and economic order which will, to an ever better extent, serve man and help individuals as well as groups to affirm and develop the dignity proper to them. As a result, very many persons are quite aggressively demanding those benefits of which with vivid awareness they judge themselves to be deprived either through injustice or unequal distribution. Nations on the road to progress, like those recently made independent, desire to participate in the goods of modern civilization, not only in the political field, but also economically. 
and to play their part freely on the world scene. Still, they continually fall behind, while very often their dependence on wealthier nations deepens more rapidly, even in the economic sphere. People hounded by hunger call upon those better off. Where they have not yet won it, women claim for themselves an equity with men before the law and in fact. Laborers and farmers seek not only to provide for the necessities of life, but to develop the gifts of their personality by their labors, and indeed to take part in regulating economic, social, political, and cultural life. Now, for the first time in human history, all people are convinced that the benefits of culture ought to be and actually can be extended to everyone. Still, beneath all these demands lies a deeper and more widespread longing. Persons and societies thirst for a full and free life worthy of man, one in which they can subject to their own welfare all that the modern world can offer them so abundantly. In addition, nations try harder every day to bring about a kind of universal community. Since all these things are so, the modern world shows itself at once powerful and weak, capable of the noblest deeds or the foulest, before it lies the path to freedom or to slavery, to progress or retreat, to brotherhood or hatred. Moreover, man is becoming aware that it is his responsibility to guide aright the forces which he has unleashed and which can enslave him or minister to him. That is why he is putting questions to himself. The truth is that the imbalances under which the modern world labors are linked with that more basic imbalance rooted in the heart of man. For in man himself, many elements wrestle with one another. Thus, on the one hand, as a creature, he experiences his limitations in a multitude of ways. On the other, he feels himself to be boundless in his desires and summoned to a higher life. Pulled by manifold attractions, he is constantly forced to choose among them and to renounce some. Indeed, as a weak and sinful being, he often does what he would not and fails to do what he would. Hence, he suffers from internal divisions and from those flows flow so many and such great discords in society. No doubt, very many whose lives are infected with a practical materialism are blinded against any sharp insight into this kind of dramatic situation. Or else, weighed down by wretchedness, they are prevented from giving the matter any thought. Thinking that they have found serenity and interpretation of reality everywhere proposed these days, many look forward to a genuine and total emancipation of humanity wrought solely by human effort. They are convinced that the future rule of man over the earth will satisfy every desire of his heart. Nor are there lackey men who despair of any meaning to life and praise the boldness of those who think that human existence is devoid of any inherent significance and who strive to confer a total meaning on it by their own ingenuity alone. Nevertheless, in the face of the modern development of the world, an ever-increasing number of people are raising the most basic questions or recognizing them with a new sharpness. What is man? What is this sense of sorrow, of evil, of death, which continues to exist despite so much progress? What is the purpose of these victories, purchased at so high a cost? What can man offer to society? What can he expect from it? What follows this earthly life? The church believes that Christ, who died and was raised up for all, can through his spirit offer man the light and the strength to measure up to his supreme destiny. Nor has any other name under heaven been given to man by which it is fitting for him to be saved. She likewise holds that in her most benign Lord and Master can be found the key, the focal point, and the goal of all human history. The Church also maintains that beneath all changes, there are many realities which do not change, and which have their ultimate foundation in Christ, who was the same yesterday and today, yes, and forever. Hence, in the light of Christ, the image of the unseen God, the firstborn of every creature, the council, council wishes to speak to all men in order to illuminate the mystery of man and to cooperate in finding the solution to the outstanding problems of our time.